Uh, but let's uh, once again begin by taking a look at the results of the poll that we took on the topic of examining the business model. So we asked you, how profoundly is the credit union business model challenged right now? Remember we said you were superficially, or the rules have changed, the game has changed, or game over. The game has changed. So at least it's not game over. That would be very, very concerning. Uh, so the game has changed, so clearly we have a lot to talk about. And, um, you know, I think I'd like to start with one of the questions that, uh, that Kate dealt with pretty early on, which is that we, you have to figure out what's broken first uh, before you start innovating. So, uh, Stan, why don't we start with you? What do you, what do you think? What's broken? Oh, well, I think we might start with our regulator. That might be one place. Uh, you may not have a lot of control uh, over that. Regulator. Uh, no, I don't know that things are broken. I think they can always be improved on. Um, you know, the challenge is, is to keep up with uh, technology and balance that with customer member service and, and keep that forefront. So I really liked what, what Tess was saying about that. Uh, so I don't view it. I didn't answer in that majority. I don't think it's um, broken at all. And uh, there's great opportunity. And, Agree with Ivan. Great opportunity for credit unions. So you don't think the game has changed? Well, it's always changing. It's yeah. never status quo. And we will always have new challenges, new regulations, new threats from third parties that aren't regulated. You know, the PayPal's of the world, uh, uh, Google, etc. That's not new. Uh, it's accelerated now. I think the pace of that change or challenge—I won't say a threat—challenge is is accelerated. But it's an adjustment to adapt to that world. You have to adapt, and you have no choice but to uh, move on. Bill, any thoughts? Well, I, I think the game has changed. I agree with that. I actually think the game has changed in a good way for credit unions. And so, I, yes, I think our business model needs to be able to be adjusted to deal with the changing needs of our members, to anticipate those needs, to involve them in the process. But when I, when I say the game has changed, I mean it in a very positive way. And there was some discussion yesterday about, and today, about this sort of closing window of opportunity. I don't think the, closing, the window is closing at all. I think it's wide open. Credit unions are a different business model than our for-profit competitors. Uh, yes, we have uh, a challenge with helping to educate our members about that, and I'm very pleased with what co-op is doing uh, with social media to help promote credit unions and the credit union difference, I think that's fantastic and it helps everyone, everyone in this room. But if you look at what's happened over the last five years with credit unions, uh, we, we are making progress. Our membership growth, measured year to year, has gone up 500% in the last five years. That's significant. Mm -hmm. And I think it reflects uh, a, a cultural shift in this country and people waking up, not enough people, but some people, waking up into this, in this country to the credit union difference and the fact that uh, there is a difference between a financial institution that's organized to benefit its members, its customers, versus a financial institution that's organized to benefit a few shareholders somewhere. And uh, if we can continue that with these great efforts and others, I, I see the opportunities as huge. We do have challenges. I'm not trying to discount that, the regulator being one of them, uh, and legislative challenges and... Uh, scale challenges that we can address through collaboration, but uh, I think the opportunities out there for the taking, we just have to figure out how to take it. Kate, there was one point at which you talked about um, a, a bank that had rescinded a fee because of, you know, customers mm -hmm. disliking it, um, which sounds very progressive, very forward, right. but, you know, honestly, I think if customers had their way, they wouldn't have to pay for anything, ever, <laughs> right? right? So how do you square that circle? How do you figure out when you really do need to respond to something, but you also have a business interest, you know? So it's an, it's an excellent question. And I think it comes down to ensuring that, that you're um, making the value that you're delivering to your customers tangible and clear. Um, so in this particular example, I probably neglected to mention that they did this whole matrix of comparing themselves to others and realized that they were not um, being competitive. But really, when it comes down to um, complaining about 
fees and you know what you pay for the services that you're getting it's because they're not seeing the value in what you're delivering and what we've learned through all of our research in this space is that if you can help your and, it, and your millennial customers by the way there's a whole segment of these customers who are like um, goal-oriented beginners right they need their they need your help with deciding what they should be doing with their money to achieve the things that they want to achieve. And that's where you're adding value. That's where, if you can turn it away from f a fee-based conversation to one about demonstrating the value, um, then obviously we're not in business for not making money, right? So. Yeah. Bill, any thoughts on that? I mean, in terms of how, how far you go to please your customer and to, to have that relationship with them. Right, well, I, I, think, it, I think it really starts with understanding w what they need. Right, and we spend an awful lot of time at credit unions focused on products and services that help our members. But I do think there's a tremendous opportunity with financial education. And sort of the light that went off for me today um, w with Kate and Ivan, we've worked a lot um, in my role at CUNA with social media to try and reach out to credit union members to get them to help us with some of the things that we're working on from an advocacy perspective. And, and uh, Randy mentioned it yesterday. Don't Tax My Credit Union reached more than 8 million people. It got 1.3 million people to actually take action. Uh, 1.3 million that we can count. There were many more than that that did it in other ways to help credit unions. But what if we could use those tools to, to ask our members to help us have a better understanding of how we can help them? It really is about them. Yeah. And if they need uh, education on how to use their money in better ways to help themselves and their families. Look, all credit unions are involved in financial education in one way or the other, but maybe we're not reaching enough people because we don't understand how best to deliver that advice to them. And maybe social media is a tool. Instead of producing a movie, maybe we could produce a program, an educational program that would help them live better, live better financial lives. And that's sort of the light that went off for me. But, uh, uh, during both presentations. But Tess, fees, fees aren't necessarily bad things. Sometimes fees can be structured to motivate behavior, change behavior. Uh, and for example, if, you, if a member were to sign up for an electronic statement as opposed to mailing it in mail, and, you know, it's, it's a positive. Uh, so, but credit unions, we're really not non-profit. We must earn a profit to fund our reserves and was, as we're federally insured. Um, but the f primary, you know, the focus of fees is not like it is in a bank. A bank maximizes fees. How high can I charge? What can I get by with in charging a customer? That's not the way credit unions think. You know, what's a reasonable fee to recover the expense of what were uh, uh, that particular program, you know, be it a, a, a bounce check or whatever the, the fee may be. So very different attitude. That's what's fundamentally different about credit unions versus banks. We just don't think like they do. We're fundamentally different in, in our being. We're, we're here to serve members. And it was interesting for me hearing Ivan talk about <clears throat> marketing myopia. And I teased him just before we sat down here about well, I had that in my MBA program in 1973. That was about three years before he was born, but I, I do remember it. And, you know, you think about it, how does that apply to credit unions? I think it goes to what business are we in? We think we're in the financial services business. Of course, I'm a little narrower. I think, well, we're in the payments business. But as Bill would know, we're really in the business of helping people achieve their dreams. I mean, there might be another way to express it but we, we really have to look at it at a much higher level. I, I think it struck a chord with me, Ivan. Yeah, and I, I, I'd have to say I have never thought of Bank of America or Wells Fargo as being in the dream fulfillment business <laughs> so much as the <laughs> screw me when I'm not paying attention yeah. business. Um, it's safe to say that, right? No one here works for any of those companies as like a spot. There are no spies in credit unions. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, just a quick education point for me for this conversation. When we talk about the original question that was on the screen of, you know, have the rules of the game changed? Is the bigger challenge that, that you feel like credit unions face right now in the acquisition of more members or in what to do with the members who already exist? Which game are we talking about? I, I, well, it's probably both, but I would say if I had to choose, it's the, it's the current members, what you do with them, and how you retain their loyalty, how do you 
How do you maximize what you can deliver value add to them? How do you help them achieve their mission, their goals in their lives? Uh, I would put that first. I don't know, Bill, any thoughts? Yeah, well, membership growth is important, but but deepening relationships with existing members is every bit as important, yeah. if not more so. I, yeah. um, you do want to have new members coming into the credit union, particularly if you can attract younger <coughs> members. But uh, it's not just the member relationship. It's, it's how can you best meet their needs, not just w with one product, but mm -hmm. with your whole suite of, of products and services. Uh, and that gets back to designing them in a way that, uh, and perhaps working with them to design them in a way that, that truly does yeah. meet their needs. And it's flexible because one member's uh, checking account or mortgage loan is different than another member's uh, in terms of what they need. But communicating that difference is a great challenge. I know for all of you out there, you know, I was CEO of a very large credit union. Bill has been and will be again. Uh, it, can't tell you how many times that you know I would get a, engaged with an, uh, someone's not not happy or was you know disgruntled member, not that we had them very often, and they would invariably say your bank did this, mm -hmm. and I would stop them, almost to the point of being rude. We are not a bank. We are not your bank. There's a big difference. You know, make sure they understood that point before we went on. But yet. You know, I think we, it's a, that is a challenge. How do we continue to uh, in, get younger members to embrace the idea that we're different than a bank? I mean, I assume both of you have learned more about what credit unions are in the last week or two than you probably ever knew before. Uh, but, 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 but let me follow up on something you said earlier and see, maybe ask you guys a question as potential credit union customers. Um, as members. I would be. Members. Um, members. members. <laughs> Very good. Friends. <laughs> Pals. Co-owners. <laughs> um, you know, you were talking about how you, perhaps your, your motives behind a fee would be different from banks, but I don't, I, don't know that, I don't know that your member knows the difference between your motive anybody, and anybody else's. Well, they probably don't unless they're shopping fees. Now, who does that? Not many consumers are going to do it, but they would find out in general credit union fees are quite a bit below bank fees. Yeah, do you I, want to I say just, something? I, I'm tying that back to the, the question you had previously asked, Kate, about you know, the extent to which members don't want to pay any fees in your experience, or you know, anybody wouldn't want to pay fees if they could get away with not doing right. it. I, I'd still hang on something that you said in your presentation, which is that I think there are a lot of experience, for examples at this point of people who are willing to pay more for an experience that is just more satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm, I use Uber when I'm in cities that do it. Even if there's a taxi in front of me, I would still, in some cases, rather wait for one for the simple reason that like having a receipt emailed to me without exactly. me even thinking about it is nice, yep. not having to negotiate tip or payment like any of it. And I think it's, it's more a question of how do you get out of the space of people thinking I should choose between a bank and a credit union and say a bank would be insufficient for what I actually am looking for so I need a credit union. I mean, if what you're in the business of is yeah. dreams, then it seems to me that there's a whole different conversation that you guys are qualified to have with members and especially when you reach out to people and get them started. Like, I don't know if there's a interview process or if joining a credit union feels more or less like joining a bank, but when I join a bank, I'm pretty sure that they're indifferent to the fact that I've joined other than that they now have to provide me with a card and checks. And, you know, if there was someone who could demystify finance in a non-threatening, non, I'm trying to upsell you sort of way, I think that already puts you in a space where like, we're your financial right. partners, not, right. You know, uh, I think we, we, credit unions, would all like to think we do that when people come in and join. I'm not sure we're doing very well at that. Yeah. You know what, I, I was just going to say that you, you posed a question, Ivan, which I think is um, one that I would love for you guys to comment on, which is, can you have a cult following in finance, right? I think <laughs> it's such a good question. Can you really get that true emotional connection where people are just, you know, s telling everybody they know that this is, this is the, the place you need to put your money and get your support. Is, is it possible to create that? I, well, I, you know, Bill, firsthand, I mean, yes, we can. We can get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even millions of members to support their credit union in things that we need to do in Washington or at a state capital level. So. How many bank customers would do that for their bank? So there is, there's a core, a group, but we have to constantly 
in our communications and, and uh, things that we send to members and interface with them, be it social media or anything else, you have to continue to try to remind them that we're not a bank. We provide banking services. That's right. And it, it starts with education because you can. It has to be the right issue. So we believe taxation is a life or death issue for credit unions, and we don't want to spend the rest of the day talking about that. We could, but we don't want to. And so on that type of issue, credit union members will engage. Yep. Millions of them will have. Uh, but it starts with education. And if they don't understand the difference, then they're not going to engage. So if I don't know the difference between my bank and my credit union, why should I protect the credit union from the banks who are trying to put us out of business? You know, it's not, we're not just competitors. They say they want to level the playing field. They have no interest in leveling the playing field. They want to clear the field so that they don't have <laughs> not-for-profit institutions that are charging lower fees and giving better rates. If, if they could do that, then they can be more profitable. So they want to put us out of business. Our members will help, but only if they understand the difference. So if their attitude is, the, my credit union is my bank, or I've banked at my credit union for 20 years, some may say that's fine. I don't believe that's fine. I think we have to educate them on the differences, and it and you don't want to educate them at the same time you're asking them for help, you want to educate them up front on what the differences are. And also, to, to make Kate's question more literal, I would take a step past even people who are willing to help you being a representative of, of a cult, you know, following for a credit union and say, could you get to a place where people are so committed to what a credit union is giving them that they would be contacting you to ask if you need help or if there's something they could do or if they would feel right. responsible for contacting the other people in their lives who they know don't use credit unions mm -hmm. and saying, mm -hmm. I care about you and as such I can't afford for you to not know that this thing is really valuable to me and would be to you as well. Could become evangelists. Yeah. Well, right. evangelists. Uh -huh. Actually, one of the, the primary engine of growth is current members telling someone else yes. how good their credit union is and why they should come. It's still the primary driver of credit union growth. It's, you know, the dissatisfaction with the big banks during TARP, yes, that helped a lot. But it's, it's fundamentally, it would be it in a family. Uh, many, many members join, you know, growing up in a family with this credit union relationship. Uh, but, or at work, coworker, you work, start working in a new employer and you know, your coworkers are telling you the, the virtues of their credit union. So yes, it really does occur. But, but you said that there's been growth. So does that mean you have more active advocacy, more active sort of raving fans out there telling people to join the credit union? Is that, is, so have you done something to make that happen? We're trying to. We just kicked that off uh, in a session this morning with uh, Daria Musk uh, to help just in the social media side through music generate interest in credit unions. But there's many, many things that do go on within the industry and, and at individual credit unions to, to do that. Well, for example, a great outreach program. Uh, a lot of credit unions go into schools, high schools in particular, with financial education programs and, and help young people understand checking, you know, loan, borrowing money for a car, et cetera. Uh, there's a national program that's helped through the foundation that Bill's currently still chair of uh, with biz kids mm -hmm. and with uh, mm. helping them understand money and how to manage money and create businesses. So there really are a lot of outreach programs. And, and absolutely. And one of the sparks for our recent uh, uptrend in growth was actually a social media phenomenon called Bank Transfer Day. Yeah. Mm. You talk about banks eliminating fee, Bank of America back in 2011 announced that they would charge you $5 a month for your debit card. Um, it's the best thing that ever happened to credit unions. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was a young woman in California who didn't like that and who established uh, November 5th, if I'm remembering correctly, 2011, mm -hmm. as Bank Transfer Day. And so a lot of social media buzz leading up to that, a lot of national attention on credit unions. And I think that on the heels of the financial crisis, because we were just then recovering, so here's Bank of America that have, they've already cost taxpayers billions of dollars mm -hmm. and their other big banks had cost hundreds of billions of dollars more saying, well, we're going to have to make up some of our losses. We're just going to charge you $5 a month. Eventually they backed off of that fee, but that was a huge shot in the arm. Bank transfer day, a social media phenomenon, led to 
a huge influx of growth at credit unions, but it didn't stop there. So those new members that joined credit unions um, did, at least at some base level, understand the difference. Yeah. Because a credit union simply wouldn't do that. Yeah. And they, those new members told other people who became new members, and the buzz continues on social media, and that growth, our, our growth doubled from 2010 to 2011, that was part of it, but it, it's doubled again, and it's grown again since then. <coughs> And it's accelerating. So it's, it's, we've got a great start. And if we can just do more to leverage that and to continue the conversation, uh, I, the, I, the possibilities are fantastic. I but think. It's, I think it's very interesting that, I mean, it was a bank customer who started that day. Yes, she was. And right? she switched. So, so it, it was just a random woman who right. was like, I've had enough. She right. opened up the sash and said, <laughs> God bless you know, her, yes. yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Do you feel like your industry took enough advantage of that? You know, Something I've, that you didn't well, it's, e start. it's easy to sit back now and, and, and look back and say, what else could we have done? We, we, we've done a lot to try and leverage it as much as possible. We've had a very difficult time, uh, and um, I guess it was Gary made the point, sort of, what are you waiting for? I understand that. Yeah. There's more we could do. We've worked... Stan's been in this business a little while longer than I have, but not a lot. We've had discussions over the years about uh, national paid advertising campaigns, for example. Mm. I think the opportunity for us in the future is not some wildly expensive paid media uh, program in an in a industry that's coming apart at the seams. I think the opportunity to spend pennies on the dollar is to do things like co-op is doing with social media and pool our resources in that way and work on our messaging. Uh, Unite for Good is something we've talked about in terms of a vision for the future of credit unions where we're not telling 7,000 different stories from 7,000 credit unions, but we're telling one story 7,000 times or 7 million times about the differences and why everyone should do business with a credit union. In fact, Ivan, back, B of A backing off that fee is just a, a great example of what you were talking about in your presentation of pressure bringing back a television program. I mean, they backed off of that due to an extraordinary amount of pressure and comments from their own customers and others on the outside. Uh, and it, it brought about real pressure on them. But at the same time, it, it raised the consumer awareness that banks are not their friend. Right. Well, one of the incredible things about this, I just have to mention this briefly, because before they backed off the fee, their chairman of Bank of America actually said on national television, the customers we're losing to credit unions aren't customers we want to begin with. <laughs> right. you, can't, you can't make that up. Wow. And you can't buy that kind of advertising. So. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm struck in a lot of the stuff you guys are saying by the notion that it's still about how do we continue the conversation, how do we generate more awareness, how do we generate interest. And it seems to me like when you, when you get into that frame of mind where it's how do we get out there to people who are not asking questions and get them curious and convince them of what we're doing, yeah. it's still perpetually an uphill battle. All of the work is on you yes, to yes, start yes. the conversation, to cut into their lives when they're already thinking about other things and try Pretty and get much. their attention on you. And it seems like you know, the, the Bank of America fee and the, the card, you know, $5 charge, are great examples of an opportunity that I think you have that a lot of industries don't, which is that there's already perpetual massive discontentment with the leading right. approach in the industry. So how do you, I mean, on the one hand, I see the value in telling one story everywhere. Mm -hmm. On the other, you know, I think there's something powerful. And one of my favorite things that, that Gary's company has been known for doing, that Zappos was famous for doing, is the, you know, that moment where they call every new customer and just tell them personally thank you. Right. And if one way to do this is to say, how do we you know, tell the same story to all 7,000 people? Mm -hmm. Another is to say, how do, we just, how do we stop getting in a position where we're trying to start a million conversations and instead end a million conversations that are already happening where people are discontent. Mm -hmm. And that might mean telling a million different stories to a million different people, but if every one of them becomes committed to you caring about right. what they're facing rather than you trying to convince them to care about what you're facing. Oh, I think to, to an individual member at an individual credit union, I agree. And there, there are some amazing stories in this room. I wish we could hear them all. I mean, some things that credit unions are doing with their membership and, and with their members, uh, you talk about, um, there was some discussion yesterday too, and, and some examples of credit unions that are doing amazing things with social media. And um, s some 
very small credit unions who you would think when we're talking about technology, how do they have the resources to, to be relevant to their members? Some of the smallest credit unions in this country are doing some of the most incredible things using sh social media, which is very low cost, telling their story and reaching out to their members. It may not impact a single other credit union in this room except that those stories about the credit union difference will eventually grow, and they can grow like wildfire on social media, just like Bank Transfer Day did. Mm -hmm. yeah. She was just telling her, it started out, she was just telling her friends that she was upset and asking others to join her, and it became millions of people. Um, the same thing can happen at, at a, a small credit union, a large credit union, it doesn't matter uh, if we're telling the stories. Yeah, you know, Kate, I'm sorry. Did you I was go going ahead? to ask a question, which is, in some of our, the work that we do, we look for those bright spots um, in an organization and then share those stories or try to make that sort of a consistent approach or a methodology. Are you able to do that here through co-op? So to, you're saying there are these, all, these, all these wonderful oh, stories. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, so, so you're able to take these stories and make sure that everybody knows what are bright spots, what are these, and, and then use, use those to better your own credit union? Right. So right, so the, so the first step is sort of gathering the stories, and we're trying to do a better job of that through our National Credit Union Foundation, which Stan mentioned earlier, and through our state foundations, which are focused on financial education, but they're also working more and more on sort of aggreg aggregating some of these positive stories and publicizing them. We also have a website now, uh, which actually started before Bank Transfer Day, but it's been growing, called a smarterchoice.org. Credit unions are a smarter choice. And on that website, it's designed with the consumer in mind. So the idea is uh, when we have con media contact or social media contact, we can direct people to that site and they can see these stories about the difference. And c credit unions can contribute their stories. Uh, and then we at CUNA try and highlight uh, several stories a week out to our members who are other credit unions to just to try and give people ideas, good news stories about the difference we're making. There's just such tremendous lives. opportunity there, isn't there, for you yeah. all to just build and learn from each other. Well, and, and we have to expand the audience, too. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, I, I found it interesting yesterday when Randy was talking, you could actually hear people when she had the examples of the credit unions and kind of some of the fun things that they were doing. Yeah. People were like, oh, right. you know, why hadn't they heard of those? Yeah. You know, it seems that maybe if you had a mechanism where that kind of thing could be pushed out somehow and everybody else could share what everybody is doing that, yeah. you know, then you just, ha I mean, that's easy, right? Right, that's the point. Yeah, yeah. and then you don't there. have a resource issue. You know, you were talking a lot about the, what did you call it, uh, fanatical support. And that example, while you were talking about it, I mean, the first thing I thought was, well, isn't, doesn't that, I mean, you have to have people who are dedicated to that, mm -hmm. and that's gonna cost a lot of money. So, I mean, I think any business starts to think about what that kind of effort you know, what, what kind of payoff you're going to get from whatever resources you have to spend. Because, I mean, it, it's really all mm -hmm. about resources, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or is there's, it not? I mean, there's, there's a pretty common statement now in medicine that, you know, a small amount spent on preventative medicine is way better than what you have to pay once you actually have are a heart sick. Attack. Yeah. And I think the same thing is true of companies to some extent. I mean, if you have fanatical, if you're spending your resource on fanatical support in advance or uh, obsessively perfect experience for people, the odds that you're going to need nearly as much resource to deal with customer support when things go wrong mm. comes down. It's partly about where you allocate and if you're trying to get ahead of or just behind it once it feels like it's too late. I mean, those, you saw the growth numbers. That was revenue. They're right. also highly profitable. So, you know, yeah. I mean, it's obviously for their business that model works because that's truly what their customers were expecting. But you're right. It's a resource issue. Yeah. Well, and we are uh, so fortunate that, and, the, and you're not as familiar with the structure of credit unions, but Credit unions work together, by and large. We cooperate. That is not true in community banks. They don't like each other. They won't share their branches with each other. They won't share their ATMs with each other, although they should because it's really Wells, B of A, and Chaser eating their lunch, mm -hmm. not the credit unions. Uh, our, our movement industry is only about 7%, 7% of the total depository funds in the country. Uh, so it, it is an imperative that we cooperate with each other. And we do that through a lot of things. Uh, Co-op is a very, very good example where we have the, the largest ATM network, bigger than the B of A or Chase or Wells, um, 
thousands of branches connected, and that allows smaller, small as well as big credit unions to take advantage of collectively working together. That's what really makes us different than the banks. Mm. And one thing, one thing I guess I'm really curious about is that a lot of the stuff you guys are describing is making credit unions different than banks have to do with differences in the practices and how you're structured and what your motives are. Yeah. And those are all valid things. The question is, is that translating into the experience people are having or is it, is it getting mm -hmm. lost in them and feeling the same? And I mean, one of the things I find interesting is a, a guy who I used to work with in advertising is now one of the people who leads CRM for Four Seasons, the hotel mm -hmm. chain, and they are mm -hmm. exceptional at it. And one of the major mm -hmm. differences between staying at a, you know, a Four Seasons hotel and staying at a lesser hotel is that they have a CRM that they share between every hotel and they know yeah. an ungodly amount about your preferences and your room has been customized to what they know you personally like before you ever get there. That's not necessarily an expensive endeavor, but sometimes the small details that right. you put into showing, yep. into creating the feeling that someone has cared about are actually the ones that are the most convincing to them. And I guess I'm curious if you guys were to flip the question and not just say, what are the things that we know make us different from banks, but were instead to say, where are the places that a consumer or a customer remember should be able to most clearly feel that we are something different than a bank. Well, I think the I think the average member and the average credit union, to be quite honest, to answer your question, no, we're not very good at that. But the interaction, they do sense the difference of attitude between a bank employee versus a credit union employee interacting with a consumer. I, I think there's a huge difference. The credit, by and large, credit union employees empathize with the member, they try to help them, they go out of the way to be courteous and nice. Uh, generally don't find that with a bank employee. And I agree with that 100%. Where, where there's a personal interaction between a credit union member and a credit union um, service provider employee, absolutely, I agree. I think where we have a, a great opportunity still, and collaboration is going to be the key to this, is we were ta talking about the difference between a, the customer experience and customer service. Mm -hmm. Member experience, member service. Mm -hmm. I think some of us are, are challenged with that in certain yeah. areas. So, absolutely, if I call the call center, if I walk into a branch or service center, we, we love our members as credit union people. Um, but do, all, do, do our other tools give you that same kind of experience? In other words, if I want to do it, I don't want to talk to someone. I just want to make it happen. Is it, is it easy? Is it, right? The things you were talking about earlier. And that's, uh, I think we've got some work to do there. And the best way to do that is not 7,000 times again, but to figure out a way to do it collaboratively <coughs> and spread the costs. And, because that's, that is expensive yeah. to make it what they want accessible, easy, quick. Does co-op have a, any unit or task force dedicated to the idea of member experience, of kind of creating the small touches that add up to someone feeling taken care of by a credit union? Well, we, we do at the level that we're a wholesaler to the credit union, so that in the sense that the credit unions are our members, if right. you will, yes. Downstream farther to the member, no, uh, we, we don't. Uh, that we, we rely upon, and the credit unions rely upon themselves to do that, but as Bill's indicating, and I know from experience, uh, we're not very good at, at customizing and understanding. I mean, there are systems, CRM and, and you know, analytics, but uh, your example of, of how Four Seasons would trick, you know, customize an experience, generally we're not, we're not at that level. It would be nice to get there. Right. Yeah, it's not right. a unique right. challenge for you guys. But. I, think I do, uh, before, I'll get to you in just a second, I do want to say that we're going to go ahead and open up the microphone. So if you're interested um, in asking a question, please uh, get to a microphone. And uh, I'm going to let Kate talk, and then I'll, I'll get to you out here. And also, if you have any questions on Twitter, I'm monitoring that as well. So please put those on. Kate? I was just going to say that when you look at experience, you know, you look at the whole journey from sort of awareness to becoming a customer, to being a customer, getting support, and hopefully telling your children that you should join the credit union. From everything that I've heard, I don't think you really have a problem with once they are a member. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the, the part of the journey that you're sort of falling down on is that whole awareness and getting people 
sort of to, to be excited about being part of this. Yeah. So we're asking about member experience. I sort of feel like by accident, maybe organically, because of who you are, you probably have, if you were to map it out, a pretty clear, pretty exceptional experience for members once they are part of the fold. Right. Um, but it's that early part of the journey that seems to be lacking just from... Well, no, no question sitting. about it. That's always been, I think, the challenge. I mean, if you were to randomly go up to 10 people on the street and ask them, what is a credit union, kind of like Jay Leno used to do on uh, Tonight Show. <laughs> I'm going to guess that uh, f at least four would have no idea. Yeah, well, didn't you say, Tess, it was like the most common question you used to yes. get on yeah. the show? Yes, still. Really? And, yeah, well, I mean, I, I left a year and a half ago, but for six years, it was one of the most common questions that we had nationally. Yeah. What's the difference? Yeah, yeah, all right. All right, I think we have a couple of questions out in the audience. Let me go right over here, gentleman in the red. Tell us who you are and where you're from. John Buckley, Gerber Federal in Fremont, Michigan. I have to uh, disagree with a statement made earlier that consumers perceive a difference when they walk in the various local offices. In our very small community, if you went in to visit a teller at Fifth Third Bank, you wouldn't be any less welcome than you would be if you came into our credit union. The difference is in the policies that the larger banks hold in terms of fees and how they treat you and minimums and everything else. I don't think that consumers care about our problems. They care about their problems. How do we become relevant such that they choose us over a bank? Yeah, this is, this is actually coming up on Twitter now, uh, the very popular question, where do our members feel the difference? How do, you, how do we answer that and how do we solve that if, if it's not quite where it should be? I mean, I'd, I'd throw in one kind of odd tangential example in terms of how to change it so that you're not being used in the same breath as banks or setting the conversation to be thought of as banks or a bank alternative, which I, I think is kind of a worst case scenario for you guys to just be spoken of in those terms rather than the terms you have. When I was living in Brooklyn, and I feel like this is the kind of thing that only really exists in places like Brooklyn, <laughs> um, I ended up leaving the dentist that I had been using for a, I'm embarrassed even saying this out loud, for a dental spa, it was called. And the main difference when it came down to it was that when you went in, it didn't feel like a waiting room. There was like music and tea, and oddly enough, there were like cookies, which should not have been in a dentist's <laughs> office, but they, you know, they, they had like Sugar -free. massage things for your feet when you, like they had aromatherapy candles. And the idea wasn't that those things would make me choose it as a dentist, but I did start to think of it as something other experience wise. I mean, even little things, you know, if you can't tell when you walk in, if you could blindfold someone and take them into the lobby of a credit union or the lobby of a small local bank and they couldn't tell you from the feeling of walking in there or the environment and it was designed and what it told them about what should happen there, that may be an area to explore. Just like immediately, what does someone feel that tells them they're in a different space than what you're trying not to be thought of as? Hmm. Yeah, I think, the, uh, I, I wouldn't disagree with your point. The, the, cons the, the credit union member experience, I mean, you'd like to think all credit unions are very friendly and warm and, and we have a nice member interface. That, that's just not the case. I wish it were. I'm sure we all wish it were. Um, are we different with a, yes, I think we are fundamentally different. There's a different mentality, a different reason for being there. We're trying to help members and not take advantage of them as customers. You're, you're right about the policies and practices and fees, sure. But um, I think, you know, if, how, would it, how do they frame that reference? I mean, they're getting a certain level of experience at the credit union. You don't want them to go to a bank, but they would certainly find out if they did, they're not going to get the same level of, of treatment that they're getting at the credit union. Yeah, I think it's interesting and excellent point. I mean, at the local level, uh, a community bank can offer great service. Is that their reason for being? No. They're in business to benefit their shareholders. And if they're not, then the next management team will be. They may, they may see that service as a means to an end, but their goal is to maximize the value. Uh, so excellent point. If service isn't the differentiator, then the policies, the fact that the fees are lower, the rates are better, that, that can be the differentiation in, in that community, absolutely. So excellent point. And how does it feel different? 
I guess it does vary based on the community. Living in Washington, D.C. and doing sort of what I guess you might call opposition, opposition research, I can tell you in Washington, D.C., when you walk into a credit union, it's a different feeling than when you walk into a bank. How so? Yeah. It, it just is. I mean, you, you're, you're welcome there as, as a part of their family at the credit union versus walking in as a customer that they just as soon not bother them. That's Washington, D.C. It's obviously different in, in different areas. Sure. Maybe that's part of the issue then. If it's different in different areas, then how do you have an overall notion of what the difference is between a credit union and a bank? Well, also, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm struck by what was in your presentation where you know, the difference between what executives in an industry thought would be the top priority of what their customers wanted and what the customers themselves thought. And, and this isn't to say that you're not right in DC and in going in and that it's a different thing and you can feel it. But I'd be curious to know if you had siblings or if your parents went in or anyone who you're close to who doesn't work in or know anything really about banking or finance or you know, the, the credit union world, would they feel that just as vividly as you do, or is your experience of it somewhat shaped by what you know about what's happening there? It probably is shaped by what I know, but I, but I would hope sure. that they would feel differently. I would well, hope so. And, and I, I do think, though, that uh, if a member has a problem, whether it's a, a fee or a check that's a problem or, you know, some transaction that they need help with, they'll generally get treated well. And, and even if it's not the answer they're looking for, it's re they're respected and they're given a good treatment and they remember that. And so that frames their reference of the credit union. Yeah, we, I know we have another <coughs> question over here. I do want to, uh, this is really interesting, um, asking whether it's our worst case scenario to be just known as the banking alternative. So think about that a little bit. Back here. Ronaldo Hardy with Shell Guys, from our Federal Credit Union in Gonzales, Louisiana. And my question is for Kate and for Ivan. Um, as consumers who are new, are somewhat new to hearing about credit unions, what part of our story do you feel that you need to hear to convince you to make the jump to a credit union? Mm, that's a great question. Yeah. Mm. I, do you want a second to think about it? Yeah, you go. Okay. I mean, my instinctive reaction would be I don't want to hear any of your story. I, I want to hear my story and I want to figure out which parts of my story you should be asking me about so that you can tell me how you can make good on them. But I, I would hate to think that I'm the exception rather than a rule. Most people, I think, are too self-centered to want to know anything except where something is going to fit into the life that's already too stressful, too busy, and too problematic for them. Um, so trying to figure out what to put in front of them is, I think, can, can be an easier losing proposition than trying to draw out what they're already upset about an answer to it. But I do think the other piece of the story that you have is that you are for the members, right? Um, and I, I think I would want to hear that because yeah. that's like riffing off what you just said. But, sure. um, you know, it's not just what, what I need partic in particular, which is important because I'm an individual and I want you to see that. But I also, you can convince me that that's the way you are, that's what you value, that's at the core of, of what you are as a, as a, as a sector. Um, and knowing that, I think, could convince me that um, that's where I want to be. I want to be somewhere where it's about me. Would you relate to be that being a, uh, joining a credit union with an understanding that it's a cooperative? REI, for example. Yeah, Maybe right. you know what a REI is. Mm -hmm. A credit union is a cooperative. Would that matter to you? I mean, you, you own the credit union. Yeah, yeah sure. That would, that would matter. I'm sort of in a, my children went to a cooperative nursery school, so I have those kind of values anyway. So, yes, yeah. that would matter to me. The thing that would stop me would be convenience. Yep. Because I, have a, I would have a, an assumption that it's going to be hard, that I'm not going to be able to get what I need done, done. Right. Um, so that, I would need you to help me to convince me that that's not an issue or a barrier yeah. to. And, and that's, a, that's a huge part of the challenge for us in terms of, of co communicating the difference because um, people assume, people, well, they know Chase, B of A, Wells, depending on what part of the country they live in, that they're, it's going to be convenient. Um, they don't know as well, unless they're already a member, and some of those, some of those members don't know, is we are, we are convenient. Yep. The ATMs and shared branches that Stan mentioned earlier, um, the collaboration and cooperation among credit unions nationally, we, can't, we are convenient, but people don't know it. Don't know. And you, you know, you might hate 
B of A, but you've seen their ATMs. You may despise Chase, but you see those blue things everywhere. We don't have common branding. We don't, I mean, they, yeah. we're not perceived as being convenient. And, and when you ask consumers what's their number one issue, it's still convenience. So yep. that's a challenge. Yes. So one other thing I'd add yep. just from my, you know, the research Oop. I've done on... Can any, I have hey, great. There we go. Um, but, I mean, the, the other thing is, you know, the idea of it being uh, a cooperative is compelling, but I think the more tangible you can make that into what someone would experience because it was a cooperative, mm -hmm. the more beneficial it is. So one of the most compelling things I found in the research I was doing before this event was if I didn't misunderstand it, the idea that beyond a certain point, any profit made instead of going to the bank and its shareholders yeah. gets turned back into you know higher returns on interest or right. cheaper fees on things. Like right. once you've heard something like that, I don't know how you could ever swallow the idea of the money not being used that way. Yeah, right. So right. Yeah. you know, giving someone that contrast between like we will always spend your money on you, not on us. Yeah. I think once yeah. you've got someone's attention, which is the hard part, that's where I think it's mm -hmm. cutting into their life is hard but then telling them what it's going to be like for them. I but think th that's why the REI more. comparison was so apt, yeah. because mm -hmm. I mean, right. a lot of people <laughs> like shopping there because they get a check at the end of the year, <laughs> right. you know, and, and exactly. why not, yeah. you know? So yeah. you just have to figure out how to communicate the, yeah. and, how, and, what your method is for that. And, right. and credit unions don't send a check at the end of the year right. in terms of patronage, but the fees are lower. And exactly. Picked up on that. The savings the rates, rates are, are better, better, loan rates are lower, and that, that's how those funds are passed back to members. Yeah. Okay, we have one more question back here. I bu oh, this is, this is a, uh, yes, this is one of our video nominees. Hi, my name <laughs> our is, idea uh, nominees. <laughs> my name is Sanam Kazi. I'm from Chicago Patrolman's Federal Credit Union, and I am a huge credit union advocate, so I just want to make this clear. I know it's a little blasphemous, um, but is there some value to taking a it's better than butter approach to credit unions, where we at least try and get them in the door um, based on the referrals, the family and friends, the eligible members to sponsor. Once they're in and they're using the service that they came for, then expand and share all the other things that we offer, um, rather than trying to brand ourselves from the outset. Get them in the door, because once people are in, they love us. Mm -hmm. But just focus on that and then, um, then point out the difference once they're already a credit union member and, and build them over to an advocate. Thank you. So, what you, did you have a question? Yeah, I yeah. just um, instead of focusing on make the education yes. piece about credit unions from the outset, is there some value to focusing on just building more membership first and then educating the existing members after? Yeah, but then I guess the question would be how are you going to build your membership without making your case? Yeah. Well, By yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a certain amount of momentum anyway. New, new members coming in. A, a lot of credit unions are involved in what's called indirect lending at the point of sale at the car dealership that mm. members join. That's the first contact that many young people, frankly, today have with a credit union. That's who loaned them the money. Well, then it's incumbent upon the credit union to educate that brand new member as to all the other services and why they're different, what's different about the credit union than, than a bank. Yeah, and I, I agree, once, once they're in the door, it's easier, it's easier to educate them. We have, you have to do it, and, and yeah. which means they have to be listening. <laughs> they have to be paying attention to what you're, edu but, but, but the question then is how do you get them in the door? And indirect lending is one way to do that. Uh, having some experience with that over the years, you know, that next hurdle is significant with indirect lending, because oftentimes they don't even really know that they've joined the credit union. Uh, but it's still an opportunity to do the education. But, but if you can't get them in the, the door that way, what's the hook to getting them in the door? It's very difficult to switch financial institutions these days. And so you have to really want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you get them in the door? And that's, that's a tough one. So I think the education sort of has to work on both sides of the equation. I mean, given, given that you said that fees are consistent probably consistently lower for most people at credit unions than right. they would be at banks. I mean, is there any global resource for the credit union industry that's the equivalent of Geico's 15 minutes would save you specifically 15% or somewhere that like you can put in, I'm in this bank, I make this much in income, I have, you know, answer five questions and be told like in seconds, yeah. here's what you're losing by being with a bank every day. There are, and there are publications that occasionally do it, Bauer Financial, I mean, there are things that, you know, trade associations put out sometimes is picked up by the general media of you know comparing banks against community banks against credit unions. Um, not a lot of that happens, but it's it is available if you want to find it. 
and we do have, we do have statistics both at, at CUNA, both in aggregate and by state, and even by individual credit union, which we'll provide, that shows on average what you're saving your members and in aggregate what you're saving your members. So we know it's close to $8 billion a year nationally. Oh, yeah. Uh, that credit union members save by doing well, business with a credit union instead of a bank. But we can break that down to the local level as well. In fact, we, we take that very example down to the ATM network side club. ATM network surcharge free. So if you use another machine in the network, you don't pay a fee right. at all. And chances are very good that your, your credit union is not charging you a fee either. Right. If you're a Chase customer, or B of A or Wells, and you go to use an ATM at, other than at one of theirs, they'll charge you a fee, and you're going to pay a fee to the owner of the ATM both. So that adds up to a lot of money, and so that savings is huge that we provide to consumers. Okay, we have uh, time for, well, you have about a uh, little less than a minute, so uh, Sam Paxson has a question. Hi guys, so I've been hearing this conversation about how we feel different as credit unions than from banks and I'm a member of two very large credit unions in Southern California and I also have an account at Wells Fargo. And when we talk about that feeling that a member experiences when they walk into the credit union, when I walk into Wells Fargo, they escort me from the door of Wells Fargo to the teller line, ask me if I want a bottle of water, ask me if I'd like to speak to a banker with any of my needs. Then, I mean, they have really up their experience level. And when I go to my credit union, I don't get that same level of service. And so when we're talking about what that feels like, I am a mission-driven person that loves being part of a mission-driven organization. I love working for a mission-driven organization. I'm just wondering, is the only place where I will feel that difference in my pocketbook, or are there other ways for me to understand that cooperative difference in my credit union, and can we innovate around that? Well, Bill? we'll have to find out what large credit unions you belong to in Southern California, I guess. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, but she's also probably in the private banking sector right. of Fargo with a very large balance. So. Right. The, uh, well, you would know that better than I, Stan. <laughs> no, I, um, it needs to be more than just the, in my opinion, it needs to be more than just the savings. I think being a member of a credit union needs to be all of the above. I think your experience online should be superior. I think your experience on the phone, in person, uh, should be superior. And uh, yeah, Wells Fargo is well known for their service. Mm. Uh, I, do, I don't think they, they treat everyone equally, so I do think they, certain all. customers are treated <laughs> a certain way and others maybe not so much. Uh, but it's, it's an excellent point, it's an excellent question. We have to be better if we're going to to win competitively, and we have to be better in everything we do. And I believe we're the best position to do it because, again, Wells Fargo might provide great service, as might the community bank down the street, but for them it's a means to an end. To us, it's what we're all about. We're owned by our members, we're focused on our members, we're, we're a part of a financial cooperative. We should, it should be everything we're focused on every day. We don't have to worry about paying dividends to shareholders. We don't have to worry about maximizing profit for a few wealthy individuals. We can serve the collective, and that presents its own set of challenges. But if you're getting superior service somewhere else, then we ought to figure out a way to, to do, provide even better service to you. But that right. superior service comes at a cost. They're does. not doing that out of the goodness of their heart. They're making up for that on whether it's Samantha's account, others. Absolutely, with higher fees, higher rates, there's no question about that. But it's also a multi-channel experience. You don't judge your relationship with any bank or credit union based on a, well, how am I treated at the branch? How am I treated on the phone? Or if I have a problem, is it answered quickly? Somebody care about my problem, you know, and it's the online experience and experience at the ATMs. So, I mean, to tie together my, my question slash the one Kadri raised about whether a credit union could develop a cult following and the question that you surfaced that we haven't gotten to yet about if it would be the worst thing in the world to be the better alternative to banking and 
Sam's question about, you know, do we need to be more than this? My answer to that would be, if you're gonna be the better alternative to banking, that's something that you can be entirely on the rational merits of comparing numbers and saying how you're better and showing people what the advantages are. Cults aren't formed on rational propositions. Cults are formed on emotional and ideological propositions. And so I think there does need to be that sense of a mission if you want to rise to the level where people aren't just going to be willing to continue using your service, but are going to feel some sense of personal commitment to convincing other people why they should also be using your service. That comes with rising to a level where everybody who uses it feels that they have something in common with everyone else who uses it as well. How they imagine themselves as part of right. the yeah. membership is as important as right. what the benefits of being a member are. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Stan, Kate, Ivan, Bill, Thank you. thanks. Terrific conversation. Thank, Thank you all. You. Okay, and uh, that concludes the Think It Out session for this afternoon. Uh, wondering if anything in our presentations changed your thinking on all this, on the business model topic. So let's bring up uh, our next poll. Your response to the following. Are you equipped to make big changes at your credit union if they're needed? There are your responses up there, your options. So go ahead and enter them. We'll see how this goes here. Ready, willing, and able. Yes. Oh, all right. Oh, changing a little bit. We should have stopped them when they were at 100% ready. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nobody else votes. Yeah. One person votes. Done. Great, yeah. Yeah. Ready, willing, and able. Clearly, there is desire in this room for change, and you really feel like you can do it. So that certainly would be step number one. So yeah. you're there, right? Yep. Yep. All right. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. for coming up to the stage. Thank you. Thank you.